I met Christopher Lee in a chat room on the internet. We had a little conversation. I was very much enriched by the position that he expressed. Uh, as such, I began to look into his work. He publishes a blog out of his dojo in Honolulu. And the more we began to speak, the more I began to enjoy our time, his perspective, the work he's done in translating the writings of the old, uh, the sincerity of his commitment to helping people understand more and broader and deeper aspects of Aikido. And as such, Create a Beautiful World is happy to bring you a conversation with Christopher Lee. Christopher, thank you for being with us. Well, thanks for the invitation. Did you ever read any of the Castaneda books? Yes. Yeah. yeah, a long time ago when I was in college, yeah. Long time. For me, one of the just poignant moments in it where um, Carlos asked him something about, you know, what is it, is the sorcerer's view, what, what is it about the sorcerer's view? And Don Juan says, it's not any more true than the ordinary man's view, but sometimes if you have both views, you can see reality in the crack between the two worlds. But mm -hmm. the piece that seems central to me was obviously this thing about reconciling the world. Its only purpose is to perform the work of God or the divine or whatever word we're going to use there. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, Aikido serves for the completion of the universe. What the hell was he talking about? <laughs> it's interesting you mentioned Castaneda, because uh, I started reading Castaneda, I think, around the same time I started Aikido. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. And I, uh, I did a lot, of, a lot I, I dabbled in a lot of arts, you know, along the way. Judo, Aikido, Taiji, Taekwondo, Karate, Kodi Arts. I told you, uh, generally, I, I always came back to Aikido. Aikido has always kind of been my core art. And uh, not, not that I do Aikido because of Carlos Castaneda, but uh, I enjoyed the, the, uh, the dream that Castaneda proposed, you know, that, that kind of uh, uh, idealism of something, something greater, something more. And that, that's the same thing that Rihe Oishiba, I think, uh, proposed. Um, it's, it's not necessarily unique to his vision or to, to Aikido, but I think that was his, his focus. Uh, his focus on the, the dream of Aikido for personal development, for spiritual development. And I think that's what drew me in in the beginning, and it's probably still what keeps me uh, in it today. Yeah, I was into yoga when I started, and, uh, you know, I, I don't know what to, how to say it exactly. Just all of a sudden, it was around the time my first child was born, and, I just felt like I've never really been a fighting person or anything like that. But I just thought it'd be nice to be able to protect your kid or whatever my BS story was about it all. And I couldn't, I drove by dojo after dojo, the idea of, you know, and then someone had called me and said, you know, uh, you got to come see this guy in, in San Francisco, the, this real weird art called Aikido. And, you know, I kind of followed it away and I meant to go do it. And then one night I was going to teach yoga at the college and they scheduled an Aikido class in, in uh, the same room. And the teacher was a guy, you know, who I, you know, just found immediately, you know, magnetically repulsive and um, very uptight and upset about what was going on. And I said, just relax, you know, we'll take a, a Aikido tonight. We'll straighten it out next week. We'll do whatever. Halfway through, my students insisted, so we got the janitor to open another room. But for me, in the first minute, and certainly in the first 10, I knew this was the art for me, and I thought, if this guy could be so the opposite of attractive to me, and the art's still calling me, you know, I just went home and I called my friend, his name was Sandy Jacobs, and I said, okay, where do I meet you? You know, Saturday morning, we went into Bob's class, that was 45 years ago been with Bob in the art ever since. And I've studied, you know, with Peter Ralston and Kumar Francis and some people you would never have heard of who did some crazy arts and along with some karate. And I had actually done a teeny bit of karate. Anyway, I've loved it. Uh, but when I, I started training with Bob, we were in a church. And then one of his students, Alan Groh, came to teach and was doing a gosh trip. So I went to that first time I was in a dojo. Didn't even know to bow or anything. But I saw the writings of O-Sensei, and they were so resonant with what had called me about yoga. I was not really into the 
pretzel part, you know, uh, um, Asana so much, although, you know, I did them. But it was, it was the, the calling of union with the divine or whatever yoga was about. When I saw that in Aikido, it just, it took me in. And I get in, I did all the technical stuff and all that for all that time. And so I'm sitting here now with that same question that I, I kind of started with, with you. is like, I always knew that, you know, I did Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. You know, you knew what you were doing in all those arts. It was about kicking ass. Mm-hmm. I, feel, I think some people train it for that. I understand that. And it's good. I, I have Daijiru and whatever came from that. Very effective. But this other stuff he was talking about, um, I feel like such a small percentage of people are actually exposed to it. That's why I so appreciate the work you've been doing, uh, the stuff I've read from you, and um, why I appreciate you being here. So I, that's probably more than enough from me, and I'll let you ramble, and if you want questions or anything I can do to help you bring it out, I'd love to know what you think about all that, that stuff. Well, there's a, there's a difficulty with Rihe Ueshiba. I mean, you talk about there are, there are very few people who are close to that. Um, Rihe Ueshiba is very difficult to understand. I think that's pretty widely accepted. Almost all of his students said they really didn't understand what he could get. Some of the students admitted they couldn't even understand what he was saying because he had a very heavy accent. He, had, he spoke Wakayama Ben you know, from the southern Japan, and uh, especially at that time, although it's um, it smoothed out a little today, as it has in the U.S., its accents gradually disappear across the country. Uh, you know, people from country areas have hard-to-understand accents, and that's uh, really true in Japan. You know, it, it was years before I could really have a kind of conversation with my father-in-law, because he uh, came from Akita, spoke Akita then. You know, very difficult Japanese. Even even for native Japanese people, people would sit around and say, "What? What? What are you saying?" And uh, well, Sensei was a little bit like that too. He, he had a country accent. He spoke in very very difficult metaphors. Um, I think he wasn't he wasn't uninterested in explaining, but he wasn't going to put a lot of effort into it. You know, he, he'd lay it out, and uh, there there was a high learning bar. You you get it, or you don't get it, or you get it, and you ask the right questions, or yeah, we'll see you later. And um, so a lot of people, there, there was a real disconnect in the explanations. Uh, for that reason, you, you get people, well, so Mori Hiroshiba, to my thinking, re- received a, uh, a technical method from Sokaku Takeda, an intent-driven body method from Sokaku Takeda. Sokaku Takeda, of course, was a paranoid about secrecy. You know, the, he, he didn't teach people. He said, I'm not going to teach people. He told his son, don't teach people, right? Only teach one person. Don't teach them secrets. Um, and he, he didn't really teach in any case, as most of his students said. That, that was one problem. Murihiro Ishiba tended to imitate Sokaku Takeda in many ways. And I think for that reason, he was, in some, in some, to- in some points, uh, less than open. Uh, even though he's probably more open than Sokaku Takeda. So he received this method. He took it perhaps to other places or to different emphases and uh, explained it to his students. Many of his students didn't get it. So we get students who, and I'm not saying that they didn't get anything, but they couldn't do anything because I, I've met a lot of students of the founder and all of them could do Something. I mean, to some degree or another. Some, some of them got a lot of stuff, obviously, from the founders. Some of them got very little. Uh, you know, it's the same thing in any physical activity, right? Or any, any activity that you learn for someone. Some people have different abilities. They have different level, amounts of time to put into it. They devote different amounts of effort to understanding it. So, uh, of course, many of the students were quite accomplished. Uh, I think what, what they all had in common was that they all had a, a difficulty understanding the explanation, what they got, they got almost by feel, by touch. Even Seigo Yamaguchi, who could do some really incredible things, admitted at one point that he didn't really understand how he did the things he did. Right? He learned them by watching the founder, taking Kemi from the founder, uh, by feeling it, doing it. But he had the model right there. Right? He had Rihio Ishiba in front of him. He could study that. Uh, then we get to their students, 
right? Their students are no longer feeling the original model. They're feeling a copy of the model. You know, the explanation is unclear because people didn't understand the words or they didn't want to understand the words. They wouldn't put in the effort. They didn't have the background for whatever reason. And so you get a, a, a gradual, like a telephone game, you get a gradual degradation uh, uh, of what's going on in the conversation. Now we're getting, you know, I, met pe I meet people who are three, four, five generations away from the founder, right? Mm -hmm. they, they didn't, they, these are people who have, you know, of course didn't meet Osensei, but they never met any of Osensei students. They never met any of the students of Osensei students. They're, they're down in the food chain. Nice. And so the message gradually gets degraded. Yeah, and o Osensei's message was not easy. So if, if people don't put in the effort to, uh, uh, de to decode it or to figure it out what's going on, then uh, it, you know, it gets lost. You, you get people, well, I mean, of course, they're different, different camps. But some people are just not interested, and that's fine. I meet a lot of people. Um, you know, I talk to them about, oh, since they said this, oh, since they said that. Uh, I was up at Aikido of Honolulu the other day, and there's nothing against Aikido of Honolulu, folks, but they have a very nice calligraphy in the front of the dojo that says Aikido Kami, and it has Sarutuhiko uh, Mikami on the side, and Ama no Murukomo Kuki Samuhara Duo on this side. And so I'm talking, I'm talking to some of the senior people at the dojo, and I said, oh, this, this means this, and they're just not interested. No, which is fine. Oh, so they bow to it every day in the beginning of class and the end of class. Um, the people, who uh, just want to do Aikido as a social activity. You know, they go and it's an aerobic social activity, um, and that's fine. You know, they're not interested in being combat arts, they're not interested in deeper unity with the universe or worldwide peace, or whatever, that's fine. Um, but you also get people, uh, as I said, there's a disconnect, because there's a disconnect with the explanation, you get people who uh, are increasingly te technical, Right? They're just doing, doing the techniques over and over for 30 years. And in a way, um, that was kind of the line that I got when I started, although I, I, I confess I kind of believed it. And, you know, you'd go into the dojo and they'd, you know, they'd show you this wrist lock, you know, this is Nikyo, and you do that for 30 years and you become a better person. And right. uh, they're like, we're in peace, right? And I said, oh, that's pretty cool. So I, I do that and, you know, for a long time. And uh, you know, after some time, Maybe because I'm a little slow, you start thinking, how would that happen? I don't know how that would happen. I, I have no idea how that would even occur. Right? So maybe that's not such a great explanation because you look around at Aikido people who are doing Nikyo's for 30 years and maybe they're not such great people. Or there are other people in other arts who are doing the same wrist locks and they're not, you know, they're not getting the same, those, those kinds of effects built into that particular joint lock or, or technical technique, uh, technique, you know. So when uh, in uh, around 2000, so maybe 15 years ago, uh, my Japanese got to the point where I could begin seriously reading Osensei and uh, reading more of what Osensei wrote and, and other things. Uh, of course, those things gradually become clear. Uh, I'll get into that in a bit. But, um, so you have the technical people. People are just doing technique. Of course, Osensei never emphasized the importance of technique, right? He never got up and said, Aikido is kotogaishi ni kyo, ikyo, sankyo, whatever. You know, every explanation he ever gave of Aikido was not based on technique. It was based on uh, philosophical, spiritual, and technical principles, right? So technique is not a principle. It's a, an ex maybe an expression of a principle or might be a conditioning method to achieve a principle, but it's not the principle itself. Exactly. One of the things Gozo Shiro said he remembers most from pre-war, when Osensei was arguably the most technical, was that Osensei always told him to ignore technique, learn it and forget it. Right? It's not, essentially speaking, very useful. It's like those world, word problems we used to do in elementary school, right? You know, the train leaves the station at 75 miles an hour, this train leaves that station at 75 miles an hour, when do they pass point B? Um, you know, that's all great stuff for learning math, but after you learn it, you, you don't remember it in college and keep on doing the same word problems over and over, right? It's gone. You learn it, you figure out the principle, and then it's done. You know how to do math. Uh, I think that always since they saw the techniques in those terms. When, when you talk to Kishimoto Ueshiba, Kishimoto Doshu, at one point he says, uh, 
you know, I started studying Aikido around 1938. He said, I had already learned the techniques by then. It only takes two or three years to learn the techniques. Mm -hmm. Two or three years, that's different than, you know, you've been in Aikido for 45 years, I've been in Aikido for 35 years. You know, that's uh, 33 years or 43 years too long, right? Maybe we should be done with that by then, right? That's so great. People great. Been in there longer. It's still just doing the techniques. And that makes a lot of sense when you go back. You go back to the Meiji era. Uh, there was one survey done of the uh, Kodu arts of the Meiji era. And the average time to get to Menkyu Kaiden, which is complete transmission in the art. Very technical, very involved. It's more technically involved than Aikido in many, in many cases. If you look at the average time to Menkyu Kaiden, which is complete technical transmission of the art, it was five to, maybe five to seven years, which is not a long time. And, and it makes sense because if you're back, fighting battles, you're not going to spend 40 years before you walk out on the battlefield, right? And most of you are going to spend a year or two, and then the people who really want to become technically efficient, you know, drill instructors or combat instructors, they might spend five or seven years, but no longer than that. So then the question becomes after that, what are you doing? Right? So um, in most cases, you know, if you're studying even just purely combat-based arts, it's really a poor investment of time you know for the modern world it's a poor investment of time probably in the ancient world in, in 1500s and 1600s people had other things to do right they're not going to spend 40 years just studying techniques uh, some of them did some of them become interested in the, the tradition uh, but that's what we have today people who uh, they've kind of lost the explanation although there's some lip service paid to it and then they uh, become technical Technical practice of doing technique, technique, technique. And the technique is is interesting. I mean, I, I love technique. I'm a martial arts geek. I like to look at different techniques, but sure, uh, not necessarily going to keep me going for, for 45 years. You know? um, then you get another group of people. Um, uh, maybe they're the love geeks in Aikido, and then people say Aikido is love, right? And of course, that's true. Oh, since they said Aikido is love. Right, Aiki is love. He said Aiki is the source of love. In 1933, way back when, when he was teaching Daitoru, teaching people how to throw people head first in the ground, he said Aiki is the source of love. Right? And that's all true. But then, one of the things that they never discuss is how you get there. Okay, Aiki is love. That's a good thing. That's the philosophy. And they said that. But uh, what the other, the part of the discussion is, that isn't usually brought up in that case is how you get there and how that would work. So, as I mentioned with Sokaku Takeda earlier, Sokaku Takeda earlier had an intent-driven body method, right? Um, now, Sokaku, Sokaku Takeda is also a complex subject. Uh, there is some uh, discussion in, in some circles that he his... Uh, his, in, his methods were heavily influenced by Shingo Mikyo, by esoteric Buddhism, uh, Buddha, the esoteric Buddhist yogic methods. Oh. That's another discussion. But he, his method of Aiki, it's a technical method. Um, he wasn't, I think he wasn't not as brutish as, as is often put out, but it, certainly he wasn't as much of a peacenik as Morihiro Ishiba was, certainly towards the end. He, that wasn't his focus, although it wasn't completely excluded. He had this uh, an intent-driven body method. So he had a, a, a principle of, of using the body, conditioning the body, driven by intent. Uh, why is that important? Well, intent runs everything, right? That's your mind. Your mind makes your body move, right? Uh, of course, normally your mind makes your body move. Everybody accepts that. You lift up your hand, your mind tells your body, your hand move, your hand moves. Uh, many of the physical things we're doing in Aikido are um, unconventional, right? And unusual kinds of movement, perhaps. It depends what kind of Aikido you're doing, because Aikido is a very broad term. Many people are doing many different things. But uh, I'll just speak from what we're doing in, in, in that area around here. Uh, a lot of times what you're trying to do is use your body in a, in, a, in a way different than perhaps you normally use it, right? So how are you going to do that? Uh, well, 
it's an intent driven, pr pr driven process, so it's completely psycho mental, but it's also completely physical, right? So if I'm going to wriggle my ears, I can't wriggle my ears. But if I were going to wriggle my ears, it would be completely physical, right? I mean, it's a physical process. But of course, there's no way to get my ears wiggling except by using my mind somehow, right? Getting to my mind to connect to those muscles. Uh, because Sokaka Takeda is doing something unusual with his body, and all these people who met Sokeda, Sokaku Takeda, they met Ueshiba, uh, all these people who met them became their students, were awed by them, were astonished by them. Uh, all these people, when they meet them, they, they, they talk about how unusual they were, how strange they are. They did these things to them and they couldn't feel it, right? They don't know what's happening, right? So what's happening is it's not magic. Well, it might be magic. I don't know. I don't think it's yeah. magic. But, uh, you know, you see YouTube videos of people shooting down people with key. Uh, I don't happen to believe in that. It might be true. I don't know. No one's done it to me. Uh, but uh, I, I do think that it was uh, an unusual way of using their mind and body. Right? So in order to get your body to do something that it's not used to do, you have to use your mind. So, so, so Kako Takeda used his mind to control his body, of course, right? He used his mind, he had to train his mind, specifically because he was trying to move his body or use his body in unusual ways. He taught that to Sokaku Takeda. Ah, I'm sorry, to Morihei Oishiba. No. <laughs> no. Morihei Oishiba, of course, sees that, he's using his mind to change his body. He's training his mind. Well, if you're training your mind, that gives you the tools to do other things with your mind, right? He's using it to affect his body, which is actually is a very useful thing to do, not only in a martial sense, but because you have a particular kind of feedback, right? I can think, oh, I, I would like to change my mind. I would like to stop smoking. But just saying that is very difficult, right? I would like to lose weight, right? Because maybe you can hypnotize yourself, but it's a very difficult thing to do. When you're using your mind to control your body to do something very difficult, meditation or something it's uh, it's kind of a meditation with a feedback so you can see you can feel what you're accomplishing or well, sensei took that intent based training I believe and used it as his vehicle for his own personal and spiritual development so for Murihi Oishiba all of these things weren't separate right you get people saying oh I want to do technique or people saying oh I just want to I want to love I want to be peaceful, uh, or I want to do this, I want to do that. But for, for him, it was all kind of one piece, the spiritual, the physical, the uh, philosophical. It was all part and parcel of one unified method, right? So um, at one point he says that, right? At one point he says, uh, you know, I achieved all this through uh, training in Aiki. He says, I don't know any other way to do it. It's fair enough. That's how he did it. You know, that's how he's teaching you how to do it. And, and, and when you get to that point, then you start getting into a neat little package. You have this physical method, which helps you to train your mind, or your mind helps you to achieve the physical method. I don't know if there's a feedback loop there. Uh, you have that, that training also evolves into training for personal development, for spirit, spiritual development. Right? It all becomes part and parcel of the whole. Then you have something that, well, perhaps uh, if you say Aiki is love or Aikido is love, then perhaps you can start to answer the question of, well, how do you get there? How would you get there? Now, I'm not saying you're going to get there automatically by doing this kind of training or any other kind of training, but at least you, know, you have the potential to, to get there. Of course, everybody, you know, everybody wants to do things. Not everybody gets there. Not everybody gets all the way there, however far they want to go. But at least you have the potential to do it. It opens up the possibility of doing it, which I think has kind of been abandoned in modern Aikido. You, you get lip service to high, highly philosophical goals, but no underpinning of how you would reach there. You have uh, uh, highly developed technical methods, but then nothing beyond that. It's all physical outer movement. Oh, since I said... Aikido is the study of intent. So when the flower of intent blooms, the world changes. It's a very powerful 
statement. The flower of intent blooms, the world changes, right? Why would it change? Or how are you going to change anything? Uh, I had, there, I've had teachers from, uh, there's a teacher who comes off into Hawaii from Hombu Dojo, Sejudo Masada. And I, I don't know what he's, specifically what he's saying when he says it, but one of the things he often says, oh, is, you have to change your mind. Okay, well, yeah, okay, everybody says okay. But that's really, that really is a very powerful statement. Before you can do anything of these advanced physical movements, you have to change your mind. But by changing your mind, it also gives you the ability to control your mind, right? Which is the key to everything, really, that you're doing. Whether you, whatever goal you want to achieve uh, in life, it's all driven by your mind, right? Whether you want to lose weight, you want to stop smoking, you want to become a better person. I mean, it's not easy, but you have the potential to do it. And I think that's the disconnect that, that's happened in uh, modern Aikido. Of course, the, the, the explanations are, are difficult. You know, Oh Sensei's language was very hard, uh, even for native Japanese. You know, most native Japanese I speak to don't know what he's talking about and really aren't that interested. Um, there are only a few native Japanese who really, I, I, I'm surprised when I come across them, they, 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 they even, read O Sensei or listen to O Sensei and, uh, or investigate in any depth what he was talking about. Um, the, the language is very difficult, just the background is difficult outside of the language that he used because from a certain context, uh, not just the Kojiki, right, and the Nihon Shoki, and the uh, Kototama, the Kototama no Isho, Shiro Yamaguchi's uh, structure of Kotodama but also the structure of classical uh, Chinese cosmology. Uh, his works are heavily, heavily overlaid with uh, Shingo Mikyo as well. Uh, opens another interesting discussion to Sokako Takeda. I'm sorry, what did you say? Uh, yeah, I, I hadn't heard that term before. Yeah, uh, Shingo Mikyo, you know, um, in, in, in the West, uh, Zen became very popular in the West. Uh, I think starting in the 50s and 60s, and then, uh, and you know, also in Japan, of course. I think traditionally the warrior class in Japan was closely associated with esoteric Buddhism, Shingon Tendai Buddhism. It's um, it's a little more magical than uh, than Zen, right? It ha so it has more uh, more perhaps more roots into you know magical powers, protective amulets, and that for uh, and so forth. Uh, but it, it goes, you know, directly back to China and then directly back to India. So when we're talking about Shingon Mikyo, about uh, esoteric Buddhism, we're talking about essentially uh, Indian yogic methods, right? I'm uh, not pretzel twisting yoga, but uh, you know, psychological yoga, mental yoga, men, uh, techniques for um, controlling the mind or for training the mind. Which is why the uh, the assertion. Uh, that Sokaku Takeda may have been more uh, involved in Shingo and Mikyo than was previously, previously thought is, is a very interesting one. There, there are a series of books in Japan and Japanese that are, that are arguing that point. Um, I'm not completely convinced, although it's, it's, a, it's a very attractive argument. Uh, there are a lot of, it checks a lot of boxes, you know, which is a good thing. Uh, it can also be a dangerous thing because it can persuade you to believe something that there's not that much evidence for. And, you know, a lot of these things, there, there is not much evidence for. Um, but it is an, an interesting proposition that, uh, and part of that argument is that part of Sokako Takeda's pension for secrecy was that uh, his teacher in Shingon Mikyo, Shingon is, uh, is an orally transmitted uh, tradition. There, there were no books about Shingon really until maybe the 1940s. It's orally transmitted, uh, transmitted and it's highly secretive. Maybe, maybe worse than Daito Yu. Right? So part of the discussion is whether or not his penchant for secrecy came from promises he made not to reveal material that he was taught, so, or not to reveal it directly. The interesting connection is that uh, Murihiro Ishiba uh, was uh, educated in a Shingon temple. Right, he was educated reading Chinese classical text and reading uh, Shingon classical text. So he would perhaps have a better uh, window to understanding what Sokako is talking about than other people. Right? 
uh, in the same way that uh, Kanshu Sunadamari or Michio Hikizuchi or Rinjuru Rinju Shirata all had advantages uh, understanding old sensei because they were in Omoto kyo, right? So they were f familiar with you know, Omoto speak, uh, so to speak. Uh, so they uh, they had a, they were more familiar with the terminology with the text he was referring to. It may have been that perhaps Mor Morihei Ushiba was had a familiarity with that uh, that kind of tradition. Of course, uh, subsequent to that, uh, the founder met Onisaburo Deguchi and converted to Motokyo, or became involved with the Motokyo, and so perhaps. It, he could not uh, talk about Shingon as openly as he used to. So the, 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 it becomes a very complex discussion, you know, uh, how much of that came from Sokaku Takeda, how much came, came through Shingon Nikyo uh, into Aikido. Did Osensei get things from, directly from Doguchi, or did they come from Shingon and Sokaku Takeda and were, therefore, and were thereafter explicated uh, in, in, with Doguchi? We, we don't know. I mean, that's still... There's still research to be done in that. Uh, I, I will say that pre-war Japan was a bad place to be a Buddhist because Buddhism was a Buddhism was a foreign religion. There, there it was a Chinese religion. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, right. uh, Japanese nationalism was the rule of the day. There was a, quite a bit of persecution of, of Buddhism in Japan. Was um, yeah. makes yeah. sense. Yeah, in, in the circles that. Osensei traveled in. You know, there, there's the right wing, and, and then there's Osensei. Osensei was at the right wing of the right wing. You know, I mean, it, it, if uh, he'd be f further to the right than Ted Cruz, probably, uh, he, he'd be very far to the right today if he were alive today. You know, in in terms of in terms of our current society, he's is one of the primary theoreticians of the right wing ideology in Japan. Uh, was his student, right? His his, his students were the commander in chiefs of the Japanese uh, combined naval fleet, you know, of the, the Southeastern uh, Asian Expeditionary Forces, the, you know, the Central China, China Expeditionary Forces, who was involved heavily, heavily in the right wing. Um, which, of course, looks bad now, but, you know, at the time, it was the place to be. So, but, uh, he, he, of course, he could not, no one could openly adhere to... Um, you know, a, a Chinese, a Chinese uh, ideology or Chinese cosmology, even though it's, of course, pervasive in Japan. Uh, of course, you have to add to that um, his ties with the imperial family, right? Of course, he had students uh, in the imperial family and uh, just the general atmosphere. Everything was focused on Japan. And ju I think J Japanese in general, even today, have a tendency to... Mm, be Japan centric, right? Uh, there are many Japanese you talk to, they, they talk, they're, they're loath to admit, even though, of course, it's obvious that anything came from Korea, or anything came from, anything may have come from China, everything is unique to Japan, right? Uh, I, I don't know how many students I had when I was teaching English in Japan who would spend hours explaining to me how unique Japanese people were. You know? They have different eyes, or Japanese eyes are different. Uh, someone, someone tried to argue that uh, Japanese people couldn't speak English well because they were uh, physically constructed, their, their larynx, larynxes were physically constructed in a way that was not suited to, uh, to pronouncing English. Okay. I, I don't know about the people who are second and third generation Japanese living in California and Hawaii, uh, but they weren't interested in that. <laughs> but it, 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 there, there, there's much of that thought even, even in Japan today. So at, at that time, I think it was it would have been prohibited for him to admit that, even if it were true, so to speak. So let's see where where were we? Where, where, where have we gone so far? Well, I'm 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 just so impressed with with where you've taken me. Um, I think where where I probably would point you a bit would be towards. Um, how, you know, I'm, I'm very resonant with what you're saying about the fact that there's very few people who are interested in that aspect of his art, um, and that very few people could understand him. Uh, Frank Duran tells a story about being there and Osensei coming in and lecturing for whatever, 45 minutes, and, and he would get up and leave, and the white boys would run over to their Japanese friends and say, what did he say? And they'd all go like, 
I don't know, you know. And, um, and Bob also tells stories of coming in, uh, not being a morning guy, would come into morning class late sometimes, and he'd see guys sneaking out the back, kind of going, oh, you know, oh, well, Sensei's doing his weird stuff today. And, uh, and I have kind of one more, which was uh, one of the people out of the Iwama school who finally said one time in one of our association meetings, you know, we never really talk much about what Osensei said, and, and I wonder if we shouldn't be looking at that. And that was the last time it was ever mentioned. You know, and to her comment, she said, you know, when I looked at it, I, it's hard to understand. And I, I did stop at that point in the meeting, and I just said, look, there's some stuff he said made sense to me right away. Other stuff made sense a little while after I thought about it, and a lot of stuff still doesn't make sense. But yeah, I think we should be thinking about it. I think we should be looking at it. And your article on the floating bridge, where I can't remember who, who the student was who said, you know, he said, we must stand on the floating bridge of heaven to do Aikido, but we didn't know where it was or how to stand there. So we just put on a good face and kept applying techniques to each other. And my feeling is then when you talk about the um, telephone game of those teachers, you know, how far away we are from what was essential in terms of his vision that this could actually change the world. Aikido is medicine for a sick world. Uh, I kind of laugh. You, you said almost the same thing. Uh, my comment was, well, if I just did uh, a 10,000 Nikkyos, well, uh, 22,000 Nikkyos, or, or if my Nikkyo was stronger, then the world would change. And it's like, you know, the Nikkyo was a way to practice something, but what are we really working on? What are we really looking for? What might we think about to help us touch into o Sensei's truer vision? So if that's helpful, that, that's what comes to mind when you say, where, where are we headed? I, I don't really know either, but that's, that's what services for me. Take your time. I just... It is difficult, and I think there are not that many people in Japan anymore who are that interested in looking into it deeply. Now, I think uh, probably the, the work for it has to come from the West. It's difficult in the West. I mean, Western people, of course, are more aggressive about this thing. They're more logical about this thing, this kind of thing. You know, uh, Japanese language tends to be less specific. You know, they're less, um, well, maybe perhaps less rigorous about the, te the terminology in many, in many cases. And the way, the way Aikido has grown up in Japan, uh, you know, it's largely a, you know, a group social activity in, in, in most cases. It is in the United States, too. And probably that will always be true, you know, the, in, the, in what it has become. Um, just the, the size of the, the art, the number of people practicing it probably prohibits. Uh, I mean, there's always a curve, right? In whatever you do, there's always a curve, right? The, the, the bell curve. There's always going to be the bulk of people who are, you know, in marking time, and then people who are just bad, <laughs> and then people who are, you know, at studying at the upper end, whether it's golf or, or physics or, or, or anything else. Right. If, I, if I may, just um, Yamada, who you know heads the American Federation, was once once said, "Well, you have to be Japanese to truly understand Aikido," yeah. which I thought uh, poor diplomacy of nothing else. But in contradistinction, direct contradistinction to Osensei's quote that Aikido does not belong to any nation; its only purpose is to perform the work of God, and um, and so I. I I kind of am, my hope is that as we start to talk about this, a few people, I don't know how many, will look a little bit more deeply into what it is. I saw Mr. Ikeda, he was teaching with Bob here a little while ago, and I said, just because we don't know what the floating bridge was or how to understand it, doesn't mean we shouldn't make an effort to explore it, you know, because those sensei said it was so important. So... Those are kind of things that are echoing in my mind as I'm, as I'm listening to you talk about this. Well, there's in many senses kind of a lack of serious exploration into uh, O-sensei, I think. Um, uh, Stan Pranen, of course, has done great work historically, and, and he's doing a lot of work technically. I mean, I think that's, that's what he's interested in. That's, that's great. I mean, so, I think what Saito did, Saito Sensei was incredible in preserving the, the, the physical structure 
right. or perhaps the outer structure of the art. Right. Uh, it's perhaps perhaps he, he was not as interested in, in some of the other aspects, but that's fine that everybody has to be. I think for a long time we've been caught in, uh, it's sort of been, um, there's only one game in town, right? So there, there, there's, there, for a long time, there was only one translation of most of Osensu's works, right? Uh, most of them done by John Stevens. And I'm not saying that the translations are bad, but if you look at any other field, right, that's been around for a long time, any, any intellectual field that's been a long time, none of them will ever rely on one set of translations, right? From, from, a, from a foreign language or from, you know, from original materials. There are all, always multiple translations, translators argue about uh, what it, exactly what it was supposed to mean. Uh, people write scholarly works on what they thought. Another person writes uh, a work saying, no, he's full of crap. It was completely the opposite. And uh, I think for a long time, we didn't have that in Aikido, really on a, on a serious level. And I think that's important for it, for it to move forward. People have to the words themselves, and even if they don't agree, especially if they don't agree, yeah. they have to be discussing, you know, he says, I think he said that, and this is why. And so, you know, I, he's, I think he said that, and I think this is why. And uh, out of that comes, I think, uh, that, uh, through that process comes a deeper understanding. You know, if I go to pick up a copy of the I Ching in the, in the bookstores, I can look, and there are 10 different translations. Right. You know, mm -hmm. you look through scholarly papers, there are all kinds of scholarly papers on I Ching and the, the, the cosmology of uh, Chinese culture and Chinese government and fortune telling, uh, divination in, uh, in the Japanese government, right? You know, you know, there was an official bureau of uh, Onmyodo, of the uh, I Ching divin divination in the Japanese uh, shogun's government. You know, I mean, there are all kinds of things you can go into. In Aikido, we, we haven't had that. No, of course, Aikido is still young, right? Oh, it's since he passed away 31, 46, yeah. 46, 47 years ago, right? Not, not so long ago, right? Many people still remember him, right? There are people here who still took Ukemi from him in 1961 that are still active, still teaching, still practicing Aikido. So it's still very young, but um, still we have to get to that point before people lose interest, right? Because there, there, there are, you know, there, there's a translation of Takemusaiki in French, but there's not in English. I mean, there's no complete translation of it in English. Uh, Budo, you know, the 1938 manual that Osensei published, um, which is mostly photographs, but there's still some very interesting text in the beginning, uh, is not really published in Japan. It's published here, but it's not really publicly available in Japan. So there are, there are a lot of gaps. And there, there isn't that opportunity. You know, the uh, internet, of course, has relieved some of that, right? Because inf information is now more freely shared. But uh, people, more people need to get involved in looking deeply into uh, what was happening, what was being said, so that people can uh, discuss this with, um, in an educated manner, right? They can, because mo most of the discussions that happen, uh, they're all kind of... Um, they're, they're, they're very opinion-based, and a lot of them based on what people's instructors have told them, right? Which is fine as far as it goes, but it isn't necessarily based on what, you know, what, what was actually said by the founder, which most people have never read, to be fair, either English or Japanese, right? They are the only translations available in English if you're not talking to someone who actually spoke to him, to spoke to a sensei, then probably you're looking at some book, which is... Um, the translations are partial. Uh, oftentimes, they're taken from sources that have been altered in some way. Uh, they, uh, they're out of context, right? Um, you know, on, on, on The Walking Dead, I don't know if you watch The Walking Dead, uh, but they, uh, you know, they had an episode out which featured Aikido. It wasn't, it wasn't good Aikido, but it featured uh, The Art of Peace, you know, John Stevens' book. Wow. Which is I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying that the translations in that book are incorrect so much as that uh, the problem with, with, with the art of peace is that they're all out of context. It's like taking random quotes out of the Bible and putting them together in one book and giving it to people who have never read the Bible. They read it, oh, that's very nice, but you don't know the context, right? Well, if, if I may, yeah. um, you know, my, my uh, rather flippant way of talking about it is when I will 
Koto Sensei, I, I try to emphasize the fact that I don't speak Japanese. Uh, even people who spoke Japanese didn't necessarily understand his dialect all that well. The translation into English was certainly questionable. So now you can say that I said that somebody said that Osensei said. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it gets worse and worse. So <laughs> it, it takes more people looking into it seriously, right, as they can. You know, I'm not a, a scholar or a historian. I'm just a person who started reading Osensei, you know, just, just for mainly for Japanese practice, you know. Well, there, there were people who... I think, you know, pick Jesus as one of the teachers, you know, resonated with the spirit that, that he was coming from. And, and yet the people who ran the Spanish Inquisition thought they were better Christians than anybody else, right? Of course. Yeah. And, you know, it couldn't be more opposite of what Jesus was talking about. And I fear in Aikido we have a lot of that going on. And again, my, my sense is, like I, I think I said in my writing to you, I don't want to push anybody through the doorway. I don't even want to say that they should go through it. I just like them to know that there is a doorway to the infinite that he offered us and to consider whether or not they'd like to look into it. And, and if so, back to your earlier comment, and I think I mentioned when Patrick came to work with me, he had studied in Iwama and he said, I always knew there was something beyond technique, but I never knew what it was or how to get there. And yeah. so my hope is that we will in our conversation here and with the other folks and stuff, just help people start to open these questions and explore a little more of what Aikido might be. I don't want to say it is, but at least our, our images or our pictures or our dreams, I'm not sure what word to use. Yeah. yeah. I think, well, once you start going down the well, it's, it's a long way. <laughs> Aikido can be very deep. I think what Oetsensei was talking about can potentially be very deep, very complex. You've heard the, the comment he purportedly said at the end of his life, where I am, this is kindergarten. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm with you there, totally. Yeah, I mean, it's just, you know, it, it's, a long, it's a long way. I mean, what's important is not, perhaps not so much what people have achieved, but the, the method that they can present. You know, um, you know, if you're in high school, right, so you're, your high school teachers, your, your physics teacher, your English teacher, they're not great scholars, right? They're, they're not particularly, they haven't achieved great things in the fields of physics or mathematics or English literature or Spanish if they're teaching Spanish, but they, they know the method. They can give you the tools, right? And so uh, it, it's important that, uh, that, that, you know, that we look at teachers as people who can give us those tools and not necessarily as exemplars of the, uh, of the perfect achievement. And even if they are achieved, they have achieved the penultimate whatever, uh, you know, if you're looking at Sensei or any, anybody else, um, there's also a difficulty in that, you know, the, the best achievers are not always the best coaches. Uh, you, you, you look at uh, athletes or musicians or whoever, uh, you might have, uh, you know, the best athlete in the world, but he, he may suck big time as a coach. He can't transfer. I, I, I took a class with Joe Pass. You know who he is, the jazz guitarist? Yes. Yeah, and uh, who everyone would put in, you know, if he wasn't the greatest, he's in the top ten or whatever. Yeah, he was horrible as a teacher. <laughs> he <was just> that, <laughs> but he did say one really great thing. He said, you know, after he ran through a number of things, he said, you know, but I don't know, just play it the way you play it. Yeah. That was a, probably the best lesson he gave. Yeah. 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 Well, it's great to have a, a, just exposure to those people anyway, if that's right. if that's your feel, right. just to experience them, what they can do, what they're doing. But, um, yeah, we, we have to get to a place where, you know, where things are not necessarily dictated by seniority or by well, even what people can do I mean that, that sounds terrible you know people who, who, who suck should be the teachers right but uh, you know if, if you look in professional sports or whatever often the best teachers are not the best performers they're the best they're the best coaches because they've shown that they can produce better athletes right? or they're the best music teachers because they've shown that they can produce the best music students and that they may not be themselves uh, and I think we, we haven't gotten there 
and I, and I, you know, you had a lot of that as, you know, the hierarchical method of Japanese society and you know, martial arts in general. And there's a lot of ego involved, so forth and so on. Uh, but we, we do have to get to that point uh, if, if we want things to progress. And that takes, you know, of course, open exchange or investigation. Internet is an amazing tool. You know, when I started, there was nothing really available. We didn't know anything. There was Aikido on the dynamic sphere, maybe. Right. I can't remember what else was available when I started some of Kishimoto Doshi's books, the basic Aikido, technical books. Right. Yeah, I think we were, we were really, uh, I think we were really Im impressed when uh, John Stevens came out with the first book on uh, Junjiro Shirata. Uh, I can't remember what the name of it is now, but uh, the, it, it actually had you know more of a more of a, a little bit more of a biography of Osensei in the front, more of a, stories of his life. Uh, now, now of course there are many more tools available for us where we can look and compare information. Where you can make YouTube videos and see other people. You know, we we didn't see anybody when I was starting except our teacher. Right. You know, he yeah. told us that was it. You know, we didn't know anything better. Right. right. <laughs> Not that they're wrong, but it's just, you know, you, in any field, you wouldn't listen to one teacher. You wouldn't go to study history and list, say, oh, this is my teacher. Mr. Smith is my history teacher. What he said is what I do. That's what I believe, right? You study with, you know, a dozen different teachers, a hundred different teachers in college. They all present different viewpoints, and they give you the, 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 the method, the, the tools to figure out history for yourself, right? They give you some of the facts, and that they can, they give you their viewpoints, and they teach you the method. 1932, when Osensei was interviewed, I think it's the first, it's the first interview I've ever seen. I don't, I don't know if you've seen that, but I, I put up a translation of it. The first interview with, uh, done with Osensei. 1932, he's asked, is there a method? He says, yes, there's a method. They say, can anybody learn it? He says, yes, anybody can learn it. Unfortunately, the interviewer didn't say, well, what is the method? Right, right. <laughs> Yeah, I did see that. I did see that. But uh, even 1932, I think he was saying that it's not, there's a method. It's not a collection of techniques, but it's a method. I mean, even in Daito, he really said that. Uh, Don Anjay's teacher said that too. He said there's, it's a principle based art. I don't know how many times I've heard that in Aikido. It's a principle based art. I, my teachers used to say that even from when I started. Daito, people say it. They right? say so it's a principle based art. You know, then, uh, of course, people, where people break down is they, they say, well, well, then what are the principles? Well, we're not sure, right? How do, those, how, do those, how do those principles hook up to all this other stuff, love and harmony and world peace? How, how does that connect? Is it just a surface veneer? It's like, oh, yeah, we go out and we shoot people, but we're in favor of world peace. I mean, we could, you know, that would be much the same thing, right? I go out, uh, we have a gun club, we go out, we shoot people every weekend. But we're in favor of world, world peace, right? How, how do the two connect? I mean, there has to be some kind of connection. Otherwise, it's just, just empty, empty speech. And then, you know, anybody can do that. Right? Why are we busting our butts on the mat for 35 years, 45 years? Why, why do you spend so much time and sweat and money? Right? It doesn't, doesn't make sense. Because you know, I, could, I could sit here in front of my computer and say, you know, oh, the world is love. We believe in world peace. and well, then that's good enough. You know, I don't have to spend any money. I don't have to break a sweat. I don't have to work hard. Um, I, if you really want to get there, then you have to decide what your method is for getting there. Maybe it's, you know, right, charitable works. Maybe you go out and you work for a charity. Maybe you're religious. You go out and you, you work for the church. Uh, you know, maybe you're, you believe in making the world better through politics and you go and become a politician. Uh, maybe, you know, you believe in making the world better through renewable energy, right? And you go on and you push green solutions. I mean, there are <laughs> ways to do it. I think I was they had a vision of his particular method. You know, person, it was a, a very personal vision, you know, just working on yourself, right? What am I doing? I'm working on myself, right? I'm training myself to make things better, right? And, and in a very, very real, real sense, I think he understood that you can't, uh, you can't force that on someone, right? You can't really make anyone do anything. The only person you can really affect is yourself. Uh, and that was much of what his training method was about in the end, I think, about changing himself, 
in order to do you know whatever he wanted to do. You know, he he would characterize himself as uh, Ame no Minakanushi, the creator God, the central pillar God. Right? That's me. He said, "You are Ame no Minakanushi. It's all about you, what you're doing, what you're training." Right? Founder said, "I am the universe." Right? The universe is me. Uchu sokowate wadiseku sokouchu. I am the universe. The universe is me. He never said, "You and I are the universe," or "I'm going to make you be the universe." Right? He said, I am the universe, it's about his training, right? How to train himself, how to train himself to become one with the universe. And you have to think, well, what is the universe? For O Sensei, well, that, that, that becomes another complex discussion, right? So we toss around many, many terms um, love, harmony, oneness with the universe, and we also have to consider those in context. But um, sometimes the, the arguments, of course, uh, as I say, many of them are complex and they're not always clear cut. So it, it becomes very difficult to summarize, you know, oh, since he said this and that's it, that's the way, right? Um, for me, I guess what always brought me back to Aikido, I guess what started me out and what keeps me going different underpinnings or some of the same underpinnings, but maybe uh, a deeper looking at the underpinnings is that, that possibility for personal improvement and how, how that affects uh, the people around you, uh, people, you know, the society as a whole. Uh, I remember George Ledyard said, once said to me years ago, he said, you know, if Aikido isn't making your life better, then stop it. Don't do it. Why are you doing it? Uh, and really, that, that's true. If you're going to do this, something for so long, people say, oh, I do it for this, I do it for that. Uh, and then it has to be about, you know, whether it makes you feel good, makes, makes you, makes you uh, a better person. You know? For in terms of what people should be looking for or what I hope people should be looking for, I, I think uh, I, I'd like people to uh, open their minds enough to realize that there are other things out there that haven't been discussed or perhaps haven't been discussed enough but they need to be discussed more, uh, that perhaps not everything is uh, simple and cut and dried and already uh, a done deal, already decided. Right? There, are, there are more, th more things in what O-sensei said, perhaps, than are generally understood, and that perhaps there should be. Right? So that if people are looking forward, if people are interested in that, certainly they should investigate it. And if, on the other hand, if they don't want to, certainly that's fine too. I very much appreciate your time and your generosity here. Take a last minute and just if there's something else, let's let's catch it. And if not, we can let it go. Well, I, I just I appreciate your pushing this forward, you know, and uh, actually being out there and doing things. I know there are a lot of people out in Aikido who are doing things, not all of which I agree with, which is fine. But I, I always admire people who are trying to push push the envelope a little bit. My sense here is there is something that goes on in here that could be much more than making a better martial artist, a better golfer, a better business person, a better person. There's something that when he said create a beautiful world, that was the one that caught me. It's like, if I could leave the world with a drop of that, I would, you know, I put up with all the sprained wrists and sore knees. <laughs> All right, maybe, maybe it's enough. I, I guess I would just say, I do, I hope we get a chance to talk some more, but it's really nice to meet you in person, and God, your generosity here has been incredible, so I, I thank you very much, and, and also for the work that you've done, because um, I, I don't know, I've resonated more with your translations. I know Bill has said some of that to me, too. Just you, thank you so much, Christopher. I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you very much. I very much enjoyed doing it.